Muy buenos días para todos. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos el día de hoy en este webinar de actualidad sobre directrices prácticas sobre cómo incorporar criterios ASG en las decisiones de inversión en renta fija. Eh, antes de dar inicio, queremos agradecer de manera especial eh, a Elemento Alfa, quien ha hecho posible este webinar, que nos ha puesto en contacto con el equipo de FTSE Russell. Eh, también quiero comentarles que para el desarrollo de este webinar vamos a tener el servicio de traducción que pueden encontrar al final, al, al, en la parte inferior de eh, esta sesión de Zoom, en la parte de interpretación, dan clic ahí y ahí pueden escoger español para que puedan escuchar a nuestro traductor simultáneo. Eh, el día de hoy nos acompaña Sarina Nasir. Sarina, eh, voy a leer rápidamente su, su biografía. Sarina trabaja en el equipo de producto de inversiones sustentables de Putsi Russell, encabezando lanzamientos globales de índices de renta fija sustentables. Anteriormente trabajó por siete años en las divisiones de mercados de capitales y post-trade del London Stock Exchange Group y tiene un profundo conocimiento de los mercados financieros y experiencia en los valores de renta fija. Antes de eh, vincularse al London Stock Exchange, trabajó en una firma de consultoría diseñando estrategi de, estrategias de cobertura para fondos de inversión. Sarina se tituló en Estrategia y Finanzas por parte del Colegio Imperial de, de Londres y tiene un diplomado en bonos y mercados de tasas fijas por parte del Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment. Sarina, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to us fiduciarias. Thank you very much, Catalina. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for having me here. And it's a huge pleasure, really. I have to apologize for having to do this in English and not in Spanish. Hopefully, if I do this in a few years' time, I will improve. <laughs> uh, but in between, please do bear with me in English. Um, so again, thank you very much. I think Catalina gave you a broad overview of my background, so I won't repeat that. Um, I'll briefly give you an overview of FTSE Russell. Uh, many of you already know. FTSE Russell is a leading index provider. Currently, we have around 17 trillion of assets under management uh, tracking our benchmarks, um, which is quite a lot. <laughs> uh, we are also part of London Stock Exchange Group. I think not many people realize. And uh, London Stock Exchange Group is a diversified global uh, kind of powerhouse uh, market infrastructure provider. Um, you know, we have a multitude of companies under our umbrella. Uh, and they span from companies like clearing houses, like London Clearing House, uh, all the way to our capital markets offering and the London Stock Exchange, the flagship uh, kind of exchange of the company, all the way to uh, Refinitiv, which is newly acquired business this year in our data and analytics division. And I guess the reason why I'm stressing that is because this kind of vast um, uh, global array of uh, companies really enables us to look at things holistically Uh, and poss possibly to have a you know kind of a slightly different viewpoint, uh, more uh, kind of a holistic approach to our clients and a holistic approach to solving their problems. In this webinar, we are however focused on one particular thing. Um, Sarina, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I quería recordarles a todos que cualquier pregunta que quieran realizar pueden dejarla en el chat de este espacio de Zoom para que puedan eh, resolverlas al final de, del webinar. I was just making a, a point about the questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Perfect. No worries at all. No problem. Um, so what I really wanted to do in this webinar is, you know, we don't have a huge amount of time, but I wanted to take an opportunity and dive into something quite specific, which is investing in ESG or sustainability and fixed income. Um, I wanted to give you a market overview of how we see this market, where we see the main challenges being, but then really mainly focusing on what could the possible approaches be, what could the possible uh, solutions be and possible, you know, kind of hopefully some inspiration um, for you to take away and implement. Um, so uh, Darwin, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. So I hope you can all see this. 
there are really uh, several key trends that are relevant uh, to this audience that are happening in the market. Um, the first trend uh, to mention is there is a significant shift to passive investing. Uh, and I'm not just saying this because I work in FTSE Russell, uh, but there's a global institution, institutional investor survey by State Street uh, that has essentially uh, surveyed, I think it was like hundreds of asset managers and asset owners uh, published earlier this year. And it asked questions like, you know, what do you anticipate the future to be? Where do you direct your resources? And the interesting finding of that survey was that yes, of course, uh, active, uh, you know, active management of uh, still dominates in fixed income and still accounts for about 75%, uh, but about 60% of investors were preparing to shift uh, to indexing, to shift to passive investing, which we personally find quite interesting. Then there's the second, uh, you know, kind of concurrent trend that happens at the same time. Um, and that's probably very much the reason why we are having this conversation, which is a, a huge shift to ESG um, in fixed income, you know, really a, a, an increased focus on the subject. And I would like to uh, present this narrative around the three points that really drive this from my perspective. The first one is uh, increasing client demand. And I mean, it would be interesting at the end to also hear your viewpoints, you know, how do you see this? Uh, you know, what, what are your main interests and challenges in here? Um, from our perspective and from our experience uh, and conversations with clients, it really revolves around an increased interest from all stakeholders in the investment life cycle who suddenly want to make sure the investment proposition is aligned with their ethical values or religious values, who want to make sure that, uh, you know, they are essentially, uh, you know, climate aware. In some cases, they're even committed to things like net zero by 2030 or so. So that's, that's kind of the first one. And the second one goes really hand in hand with that. And that is uh, increased uh, kind of awareness of the impact. And that really stems from the fact that if we want to achieve, let's say 1.5 degrees uh, Paris alignment, we cannot do that um, whilst ignoring the second biggest asset class in the world, uh, fixed income. Uh, so there's an increased demand to have more transparency across the whole portfolio not just equities. And I think that's, a, that, that's, really, that's really key. Um, and of course, both of these things are driven by, uh, you know, and are kind of encouraged by the regulation. <clears throat> so I really like this graph that you see at the bottom, the green graph. <laughs> uh, so what the graph shows you is a cumulative number of policy interventions in investment process or uh, in, in kind of investment uh, required disclosures for the investors. So the key, the key point of this graph is that we can't avoid it, right? It's, it, it's coming our way, <laughs> we like it or not. And some regions such as Europe are far ahead, uh, but other regions will catch up and it will kind of become much more uh, widely spread. And probably to give you some ideas uh, and some more color around the regulatory point, there's really two types uh, of regulation uh, that we see coming into play. Uh, the first one is regulation of, uh, you know, that, that, that tries to set a framework that say you can't just call anything sustainable, sustainable. you can't just say uh, improvement in ESG without having a specific framework or without disclosing specific metrics around it. You know, so they really want to ensure there's some transparency, uh, you know, and, and make sure that there is, uh, yeah, that, that there's a fair reflection and comparability across the markets and portfolios. The second one is probably uh, even more interesting kind of from our perspective, and that's really regulation that looks at uh, investment process. So that's a regulation that really mandates in your investment process, these are the things you should take into consideration. A good example of that are Dutch asset owners. So in the Netherlands, asset owners are required to uh, incorporate something called UN Sustainable Development Goals, UN SDGs. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with them, uh, UN SDGs is essentially uh, a series of 17 goals uh, that were implemented in and they were kind of set up in 2015 by the General Assembly of the UN. And their goals that are supposed to be achieved by 2030 should we all have uh, kind of sustainable uh, living and, and, and 
kind of good quality of life. Um, and they include things like uh, goal number one, no poverty, um, climate action, affordable clean energy, clean water for everyone. So the interesting part we actually have in our portfolio, we actually worked with, um, this is very public with a asset owner called uh, Detail Handel um, in the Netherlands. And we created a portfolio, uh, an index I should say, uh, that is uh, aligned with four of those uh, 17 sustainable development goals. Um, so that's, that's, you know, that's kind of, um, to, to give you a flavor of what regulation can mean in your context. And the, if I kind of turn to the, to the gray part of the slide and the evolution, uh, so I really see that there's a strong evolution of how we approach fixed income investing, uh, you know, over the, past, over the past decades, really. I mean, a, a couple of decades ago, if you spoke about uh, fixed income investing, you would really speak about green bonds. I mean, people didn't know anything other than green bonds, right? Um, and green bonds, again, so it's a, it's a, it's a great um, way to finance green um, activities, I suppose. It's a classification um, typically uh, attributed by uh, companies like Climate Bonds Initiative, where you have to certify that use of proceeds of your bond have to uh, be, they have to be used for a specific type of green uh, purposes. You know, and that's that's great, but essentially that's 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 one of that's one of them, right? Uh, it, it's you can't you can't kind of change the world with just having those, and you can't have just green bonds in your portfolio because there simply isn't enough of them. So then the market evolved more to be more around kind of exclusionary, you know, so looking at excluding certain sectors that are less or more or less desirable. So this can include things like ex fossil fuel index, right? So essentially making your um, you know, or ex fossil fuel portfolio, we can say in this case, making your um, <clears throat> kind of portfolio uh, low, low carbon by removing high, high emitters. And then it kind of progressed to being more, uh, oh, I'm sorry, can I ask everybody to go on mute? I can hear some background noise. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, then the uh, kind of the, the next step in evolution, as I see it, is really incorporating a mix of exclusions and tilts. Uh, so, you know, you can have, uh, and this, this is an approach we, we take as well uh, in our indices currently. So you would exclude something. Um, and, and I think the concept uh, I, I would like to kind of bring to everyone's attention that's commonly adopted across asset owners, as a, uh, uh, kind of managers and also regulators to some extent is a concept of baseline exclusions. So what baseline exclusions are, are essentially a set of minimal exclusions that are very hard um, to argue with in your sustainable investment portfolio. So uh, those are the things that are really uncontroversially uh, bad <laughs> to, be, um, to be kind of blunt. So typically they would include things like um, controversial weapons. So, you know, those are of course illegal. So you, you, know, you can't um, kind of have those in your portfolio uh, if, if you want to be truly sustainable. Uh, they quite often include things like tobacco players, uh, because tobacco, again, there's no safe amount of tobacco you can consume. And sometimes they would involve things like um, uh, thermal coal. And then depending on kind of which uh, asset manager, asset owner, regulator you look at, they can go a little bit further. They can go all the way to things like um, wider fossil fuel producers or uh, going a little bit further on, the, on things like alcohol, et cetera. But the idea in there is simple. So, you know, the impact of these on your uh, index is likely not to be huge, you know, but you have bare minimum kind of, you know, standard of uh, exclusions at the bottom, but you keep majority of your index in. And then with the rest of the index, you tilt it based on the desired outcome. So if the desired outcome is to have better companies with better ESG, you overweight companies with higher ESG and underweight companies with lower ESG. And I think I will have a specific example of that at the end, uh, where we have done exactly that on the Latin American um, universe. And I think that will be quite interesting to see that in practice. So that's kind of on, um, <clears throat> on that approach. And then the other thing I wanted to call out is that as we go, um, you know, and, and fixed income is very much, um, it's behind equities, but this, the pace at which it's catching up is very high. 
uh, you know, so it's not going to be long <laughs> before it's, it's fully there. Um, so what we see now, what's emerging now, is a range of different um, con portfolio construction techniques. You know, so we use optimization, we can even use target exposure. There's also a wider range of bonds. So we suddenly don't just have green bonds, we have sustainability bonds, we have transition link bonds. And those are essentially products, whereas uh, the covenants uh, of the underlying security are linked to certain rules. So if it's transition, transitionary bond topologies, uh, you know, you would uh, have to stay, you would have to set certain criteria set on your way to transition. And if you breach them, you would have, it would have impact on coupon, for example. Uh, you know, and that's an interesting uh, kind of market development. And then I suppose before I move to the next slide, um, the other kind of three things probably to call out there that I really see impacting um, impacting a kind of the, the fixed income market uh, more generally in the next year. Um, the first one is uh, we have seen, and I think this will really continue, a huge increase in sophistication of fixed income investors. Now, what I mean by that is that <clears throat> Investors are suddenly not just asking if we can do, you know, whatever it is, green bond index or exclusionary index, but they actually understand that the way you approach it in fixed income has to be quite different to the way you approach it in equities. And we get questions like, <clears throat> is G pillar, the governance pillar, more important in fixed income than it is in equities? Um, what should they do with duration when they have a climate solution or when they are on the net zero pathway? And this is very encouraging. This is, you know, this is fantastic. I think it also presents a very positive challenge for um, uh, kind of the market and all of us um, to really think about how do we make sure <clears throat> that we do this right in fixed income and that we capture uh, the correct the characteristics of the underlying um, portfolio. The second trend, and I, I'm not going to kind of go into huge amounts of it in this webinar, but I think it's worth uh, <laughs> having it as a theme on its own. Uh, that's going to be coming is climate indices or climate portfolios. So that's a huge <clears throat> emerging, um, that's a huge emerging theme. And I think what I wanted to, what I, maybe what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you an example of an EU climate benchmark. So we have a regulation that came into place recently in Europe that essentially says that every benchmark provider that wants to have an index that's called Paris Aligned they have to follow a certain set of criteria and they have, achieve, they have to achieve a certain number of uh, kind of thresholds. And if they do, then they have a certification from EU climate benchmark that this is a Paris Align benchmark. And those things for inspiration uh, include things like removing high emission sectors, so removing fossil fuels um, <clears throat> and so on and so on. And that's probably not very surprising. Then it has 30 or 50% reduction target in emissions at the time of launch in comparison to the underlying benchmark. You know, so that's, that, can be, that can be quite significant. <laughs> and then most importantly, what they do, they have a 7% uh, annual decarbonization target. So your portfolio has to decarbonize 7% year on year every year. And as an index provider, we have to uh, resubmit the results to, to keep the, the stamp of the EU regulation. So we cannot deviate from this. I think we can, we can skip it for one year, but then we, we, if we do it for two years in a row, you lose the, um, the, the stamp of approval, so to say. So, and I think, you know, that's, that's just to give you an example of where, uh, what's happening in the other regions. And then the, the, last, the last bit that's worth mentioning. So in here, we're really gonna focus on, you know, kind of ESG, SI, um, kind of slightly more broadly. Um, the trend that I see happening in the next year is that all sustainable investment data sets will be subjected to much higher regulatory scrutiny. So this has already started partly. A good example of that is IOSCO, which is an international organization of securities and commission and they have recently, I think this summer, proposed a set of recommendations for their local regulators to improve reliability and comparability of uh, ESG scores. Uh, and Darwin, if you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Thank you. So I'm sure this audience is very familiar with the, 
uh, kind of ESG scores. So I'm not going to go into detail and tell you, <laughs> tell you kind of what they are and how they work. Um, but it's three things I really wanted to call out um, that I think are relevant for this webinar. Uh, the first one is there's many different providers of ESG scores. And there's actually studies um, published, and I can kind of share a link if it's on a, of an interest, that show there's quite a low uh, correlation between some of them, between the actual scores. So, you know, bear, bear, bear this in mind. From LSEC perspective, <clears throat> we are very much aware that there's no one right way to create an ESG score. I mean, what you're trying to do that, uh, there is essentially have a data set that assesses a company uh, across a wide range of uh, issues and tries to convey it into one number. Uh, you know, it's, it, and, and there's no right or single way of doing this. Our approach to this is to have a full transparency and full disclosure. So we operate very much on using publicly available information and having a rules-based approach. So you know exactly how the scores are constructed. And if you actually log into Refinitiv Acon, you can actually drill into each score. So you can drill it and you can trace it back uh, to the actual kind of article or the original source based on which it was scored. So we think, you know, whilst we can't, uh, nobody can have kind of the perfect right data set, we think it's very important to be transparent and to be rules-based. Um, you know, and, and that kind of helps because I think quite often if you can't explain why the score has changed because it's down to the discretion of the analyst, it's very much kind of a black box approach and we try to avoid that. Um, and then the last, the last point on this one uh, to make really, it's uh, actually one before last, <laughs> is the ESG scores have biases. Uh, and this is very natural. So we have a paper and I'll make sure to share kind of a link to that uh, after the webinar, where, where, where our team try to identify and kind of isolate different biases. And what I mean by biases, it's, it's simply to say that companies that are larger they're in specific industries or countries uh, are more likely to have higher ESG score or lower ESG score. Uh, you know, and this is, it's important to be aware of that when you're constructing an index. <laughs> and I'll kind of give you specific examples later. You know, but it's, um, it's, it's kind of, it, it's natural. Um, you know, if you think about a large company that's in um, developed market, it's much easier for them to have a large department um, that's probably devoted to putting together reports and disclosure of information that then in return leads to better ESG scores because we can actually um, access that information. And then uh, very quickly, the last point is that sometimes when you're using ESG scores, the coverage can be uh, low, particularly for private issuers because it's typically, the data sets are typically inherited from uh, equity side but also similarly for high yield and emerging markets. I should say LATAM in this case, in, in our case, <laughs> we worked hard to kind of increase the coverage and to have uh, a good coverage of that region. We actually have a prototype benchmark launch for that and I'll kind of show you that at the end, but it's just something to bear in mind. Uh, if you can do the next slide, Darren, thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to do here is really to start thinking in compartmentalizing it, um, you know, what are really the different investment objectives and investment um, approaches you can have. And it would be very good actually after the webinar to hear uh, from the audience, you know, so to hear really how do you, how do you invest, what do you consider. Um, from my perspective, I think investors have a spectrum of different objectives. Uh, they have different mandates, they have different expectations placed on them by their beneficiaries regulators, wider public, um, you know, and, and therefore we kind of, at FTSE we try to cater um, to, different, to different investor types and have, offer kind of different approaches. And what I wanted to do is to break down, you know, the four key types of investors that we see in the market. And that's what you see in the kind of in the box, in the um, blue green box. <laughs> Uh, FTSE has interesting colors. We always have much more sophisticated colors, so you can't say it's just red or blue or green. Um, so yes, it's in your uh, right-hand side. So the first type of investor uh, we look at is the investor that is really looking to incorporate certain non-financial objectives, be it ethical, sustainability, societal values in their portfolio but they don't really want to give up too much or hinder too much their financial performance. 
you know, and this is and this is a very this is a very common type of investor. Um, you know, and we have uh, kind of solutions that address that. The second type of investor that we see more commonly in Europe than anywhere else is same as the first one, but they actually have uh, ability to sacrifice a little bit more uh, of their financial performance, whether it be tracking error or yield or uh, other metrics. The third type of investor is looking at ESG really as a risk mitigation. Uh, you know, and, and this is this is not a <clears throat> kind of this is not a bad approach in fixed income. You know, reducing the number of companies uh, that are more likely to default or have misconduct uh, makes sense. Uh, you know, there's uh, it reduces reputational risk uh, possibly as well. You know, there's some evidence that high ESG companies are better at managing business and operational risk. You know, so that would support that argument for uh, you know lower idiosyncratic risk. Um, and then there's the fourth type of investor that looks at ESG as a way to enhance performance. And I have to say with this one, the evidence is a lot weaker on fixed income side. Um, the evidence is a lot stronger on, on equity side, uh, you know, but there is, um, there is such investors and there's actually some studies. Uh, I've read about three studies on this and they each came to different conclusions. So I kind of let you <laughs> um, kind of uh, do your own research as a person. Uh, see what you think of that but there's no there's no consensus on that quite yet and if you can go to next slide darwin thank you so the next thing i wanted to talk about was really the challenges um, and why is it that it's quite different implementing esg or uh sustainability in fixed income to equities <clears throat> and i'm going to call out four specific ones that I think are worth mentioning, and I'm sure you're more familiar with them than I am. <laughs> so the first one is the fact that there is no one single fixed income. There is a range of sub-asset classes, right? We have corporates, and here in this presentation, I focus on corporates particularly, but um, I'll touch upon sovereigns as well. Uh, you know, there's sovereigns, there's sub-sovereigns, there's uh, securitized, et cetera, et cetera. And depending on what asset class you have, you would need to have a different data set. So the way you look at the ESG performance of a country is very different to the way you look at the ESG performance of a company. Similarly, with securitize, the way where the risk lies in a different place <laughs> than it would for, for kind of traditional corporate. So, and we have teams and we have uh, kind of a wide range of SMEs and thought leaders that really kind of address this, you know, and we have wide, a really quite tangible research team uh, that looks at different models, you know, assesses different possibilities, et cetera. You know, but it's, that's kind of challenge number one, <clears throat> making sure that you have data sets. What are you, what exactly, what sub asset class you're gonna look at, et cetera. Uh, the complexity number two is the corporate structure and the presence of private equities, uh, sorry, private issuers, not private equities. <laughs> and um, the reason why I like that graph or that um, picture you can say, <laughs> Um, my colleagues call it the exploded pl planet. So what we have done there is we have taken um, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, which many of you probably know is the US based multinational company. And we have essentially um, <clears throat> taken its whole uh, corporate tree structure and tried to, uh, which is by the way, around 800 entities, if you count affiliates and subsidiaries and try to portray its relationships <laughs> You know, so this just and many of these, of course, are private issuers. So this just goes to show, you know, that if you were had this picture in uh, equities, it would be a lot simpler. Uh, you know, and this is what we have to this is the type of metadata we have to work with in fixed income. And we have a way of, again, addressing this, you know, so things like if you're going further down the dot uh, that's far away from the core of the company, you're likely not going to have data coverage there. So we have a way of addressing that, uh, whether through model scores or kind of climbing up the issue tree and using the parent company's proxy. Um, you know, but it's a, it's a, it's an existing complexity that really uh, doesn't exist in equity, uh, and it's something that uh, you need to bear in mind. The third one um, is a relatively obvious for any fixed income investor. So, <laughs> bonds, unlike equities, have several uh, characteristics. The more the most the kind of prominent one is the fact that they have maturity, they are not perpetual, uh, typically at least anyway, uh, and they have duration and they have spread, um, you know, and they have lower liquidity and, and the uh, kind of the risk return profile is completely different. 
And we, when constructing an indices, and I will give you a few examples in this webinar, we take those considerations into account. You know, so to give you an example, if you are using a data set uh, that is used as a screen in our portfolio, <clears throat> in our index, we make sure it has certain attributes like a stability, because what we don't want to happen, we don't want an investor who replicates our index to have to sell and buy the same bond twice a year, um, simply because the data set is not particularly stable. Uh, we don't want to create an unnecessary churn because we understand the liquidity is lower, you know, the implications, the cost implications are um, material. And then the fourth one, uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, it would be very good to hear if anyone in the audience here has any experience with this, is really the stewardship and the company engagement. So as an equity uh, investor, you uh, can use stewardship and you have a voting right and you own the company and you can uh, essentially uh, directly um, execute your, uh, your, your power, right? So you can directly uh, veto um, things in the, on the board. As a bondholder, you don't have that. So the way you influence company and its conduct um, that's in your portfolio is different. They do exist. Um, and I think they're developing significantly kind of over the uh, past years, but they're different. And it's just something to call out to be aware of. Um, so that's, that's kind of one of the challenges. If we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. And then I wanted to really take you through something relatively pragmatic. So let's look at each of the investment approaches we can have. And what are the considerations we need to bear in mind when adopting each? So let's say uh, you want to do exclusions in our portfolio. And this is a very popular way to address um, kind of removing undesirable uh, issuers from um, your portfolio. And I guess the first consideration, the first question I would ask you is where would you draw the line and how would you draw the line? So would you say that uh, you are going to remove anyone uh, based on a numerical score. So if your uh, score is, let's say, sorry, everything okay? Yeah. Uh, if there is, if you're going down the route of removing, uh, introducing a screen where you remove issuers that have a score lower than X, the issue I suppose with that is, th think about the long longevity. So let's say you, you have a score zero to a hundred and you're going to remove everybody who's less than 40. But what happens if over time their scores improve or decline? You know, so essentially by implementing that approach, you don't have a visibility in the longer term how many companies are gonna be included or excluded from your portfolio. That's one. The second one, if uh, somebody challenges you on that, you know, how would you, how, you need to have a very clear rationale of defending that. You know, so, so it's, it's not, you know, it's, it, it's not straightforward, is what I'm trying to say. Um, the other approach of taking the bottom X percent uh, is something we have taken quite often. The reason why is typically when you, sometimes when you have a, a threshold that's based on the number, you have to adjust it as you go for the reasons I just mentioned, whilst uh, kind of keeping the stability, knowing that it's always gonna be X percent of the portfolio is, is, is sometimes more desirable. The other thing to bear in mind is, uh, if you remember what I said about biases in the ESG uh, scores, we have to make sure that when we implement this, that we bear those in mind. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a global broad investment grade uh, portfolio. Um, and let's say you wanna implement that you wanna remove, you would just wanna blankly remove 25% um, um, of the bottom, or uh, it can be a numerical threshold. So by kind of, depending on what data set you use, of course, by simply removing that chunk, you will essentially get rid of all your major markets. You would probably get rid of all your small caps and you would probably get rid of a lot of utilities and energy and mining companies. You know, so <clears throat> I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm, I'm saying you need to bear in mind that that's the kind of skew you will get. Um, you know, so it requires it, it it requires a bit of thought when constructing the portfolio, but it's actually possible to do it and to do it well. Um, and I'll show you kind of an example of how we approached it at the end as well. The disadvantage, just to briefly mention, of exclusions 
is that once you exclude the companies, you um, obviously don't have any uh, kind of, you can't use your stewardship. So, you know, you can't persuade them to, um, or pressure them to have better ESG or to improve their practices. You know, so that's kind of a disadvantage. And then the other disadvantage as well is assume they improve over time, um, you will have to uh, kind of probably buy them later uh, at the less favorable financial terms. Um, so, you know, so that's just to kind of give you some food for thoughts and some considerations. Another approach could be tilting, you know, so essentially having, keeping most of your portfolio companies in, and uh, to put it bluntly, you can do something very simple. You can overweigh the companies with good ESG and underweigh the companies with bad ESG. Or you can do something a lot more sophisticated and a little bit more dynamic. You could look at your uh, bond portfolio and see kind of the different tilt based on different pillars, E, S, and G. You can also tilt on different pillars over time. So the argument for that is uh, different factors have different relevance at different point in time of the life cycle of the bond. So for example, G governance is much more important in the short term for the performance of the company, whilst E environment is much more important for the long term, particularly if you're looking at kind of climate adjusted solution, because of course the negative impact of climate change is going to be more tangible the further out we go. Uh, you know, so you can kind of <clears throat> overweigh G in the short term, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, adjust your portfolio based on those uh, assumptions. So, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, uh, another possible approach. So, um, again, the disadvantage of that, I guess, is that, um, or, more, or more, I, should, I should probably start with the advantage. So advantage is the fact that, you know, you don't, you keep most of your companies in, so, you know, you can continue to, pers uh, to pressure them uh, to improve their practices, uh, you know, and give them that incentive to improve uh, their ESG scores, um, you know, um, but essentially it's, it's, you can still use, uh, you can still overlay it with certain baseline kind of exclusions along the lines of something like thermal coal or virtual weapons, which I think in, in, um, in the context of the local market would have minimum impact anyway, probably. The other, uh, the other thing um, I wanted to mention is what do we do when there's no data? So this is quite a common, uh, com quite a common question we get from the clients, you know, so, you know, what are the um, kind of approaches and what are the implications? So I'll tell you how we um, think about it. And in fixing them, it's particularly pertinent because the coverage, as I said earlier, can be quite patchy. Um, <clears throat> so the first approach, and the most conservative one is to simply remove any companies that have no data. Um, or in total context, that would mean keeping them uh, neutral. Um, so, you know, that's, sorry, actually, you can do, you can do either. So you can either uh, kind of remove them completely or keep them neutral. That's something we do in equities quite a lot. But again, that's driven by purely by the fact that the nature uh, and the number of companies that don't have data is a lot lower than in fixed income. Or we can keep the companies in. That's another option, right? So you keep them in. Uh, you assume that they're innocent until they're guilty. So once you know what, you know, once they do get researched and they do have um, the information available, then you kind of um, approach them and then you, <clears throat> and then you, uh, you, you know, then you whether exclude them or you tilt based on that information. There's also a third option and there's kind of, it doesn't have to be either or. So what we quite often do um, in ESG context, particularly, so in ESG, we have no um, coverage for certain universes for uh, private issuers. So what we have done, we have a big uh, sustainable investment research team. There's a lot of data scientists in that team. We have essentially developed a model that uses machine learning. We feed it with uh, information we understand that uh, company score is driven by several factors such as size, industry, et cetera. <clears throat> and we model the scores. So we use these model scores in tilting context. We don't really use them in exclusionary context because we think that's better than kind of keeping them neutral. It still provides you a better um, quality of disclosure. The other option that you can use, you can use supplementary data sources. So, you know, really try to be 
bit more innovative, try to plug those gaps somewhere where there's other type of data available. And something else we do in fixed income I mentioned earlier is particularly for uh, private issuers is we uh, tend to, if it's a private issuer that has a public parent, we can use the public parent's ESG score as a proxy for that private issuer. So we essentially climb up the issuer tree and adopt the ESG of that uh, issuer. What I should say is that from kind of the, the from there's some strong evidence um, from what I see, um, you know, in the market currently that removing a small portion of your uh, worst offenders in the portfolio may, in fixed income, yield the best balance between kind of financial attractiveness and the ESG benefits. And the reason why is because obviously there is asymmetric <laughs> risk return profile in fixed income. And by removing the bottom layer, um, you essentially get rid of your tail risk. You know, so really the probability of default, and there's again studies, I think Barclays uh, showed this recently, it's that there is a really a strong correlation between ESG scores and your probability of default downgrade. You know, so by removing that bottom um, kind of ESG uh, underperformance, you uh, really sig significantly kind of impact your uh, tail risk um, of, of the fixed income portfolio. So that's on the investment approaches. If I can have the next slide. Apologies. So <clears throat> what I wanted to um, demonstrate here is to give you a couple examples of what can happen if um, you approach it too simplistically, um, you know, and, and, and th things to avoid when building your uh, ESG fixed income portfolio. So the, you know, when you're building fixed income portfolio, there's a really clear balance uh, of interconnected variables uh, that need to be considered carefully. And their relationship between each other uh, is kind of needs to be assessed to, to really avoid possible kind of negative consequences. And I'll give you three examples. So the first one is concentrated portfolios. So, you know, quite often, sometimes investors want to be very aggressive on their ex exclusions and they exclude so much that they end up having a very concentrated and um, unattractive portfolio. And I'm sure you're probably more aware of this than me because I know you're uh, kind of underlying Colombian underlying market is kind of also no particularly diversified um, or huge um, universe uh, of companies. The, the extension of that problem is that sometimes what happens in fixed income is that by, for example, uh, looking at things like ex-fossil fuel index where you remove a lot of fossil fuels, you end up uh, overweighing banks <clears throat> or financial institutions. Now, that's not necessarily kind of bad in itself, but the criticism you may get is that in spirit, banks are the ones that are essentially financing oil and gas exploration. So therefore in spirit, you're not necessarily aligned with low, uh, with low carbon or low climate. Um, the way to solve for that is that you can introduce a cap on specific sectors. Um, you know, and that's something we do uh, in some of our benchmarks as well. So that's, that's kind of those two. And then again, but just to, uh, give you another flavor of what I talked about earlier about ESG biases and risk characteristics uh, <clears throat> by approaching uh, ESG portfolio too simplistically, you know, uh, and essentially let's say you want to pick just the top performance of ESG in fixed income without controlling for, controlling for the underlying risk characteristics or anything else, uh, you will essentially end up with a biased portfolio, right? Most likely uh, that will consist of large companies with uh, low spread um, high credit rating and low yield, you know, so you need to uh, bear that in mind. And then what I thought would be interesting, so if you look at the bottom, um, bottom of your slide <clears throat> under the picture in the gray box, um, so Fidelity have recently conducted a study of ESG scores and bond characteristics. Um, and this is, again, this is a sample study, you know, so this is not something I'm sure if, you know, you can maybe find something that contradicts it, but I thought this would be something quite interesting. And essentially the relationships they have observed uh, based on this quantitative analysis is that high ESG companies tend to have lower leverage. So this is consistent with the fact that, you know, obviously if you have um, higher leverage, you're more likely uh, to default, you know, and kind of 
that, that whole interrelation with the ESG, um, with the ESG. So then there is the higher sales, which essentially correlates to the large company bias, higher dividend yields and similar margins. So, you know, just an example of um, how the different bond characteristics can interplay in the portfolio construction. So that's, that's kind of the broad uh, bulk of what I wanted to talk about. Now, Darwin, if you could bring the next slide. Thank you. So what I want you to do now really is to give you a practical example of something that's a little bit closer to you. Um, uh, and this, this is a prototype index that we have actually only launched uh, literally a few days ago. Uh, but I wanted to bring this to you and to kind of show you an example of what we can do. So we have launched a Latam Corporate Index and that's a carve out of uh, our FTSE Emerging Market Broad uh, Bond Index. <laughs> it's a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> And we created essentially three types of uh, that index uh, to our screens, one based on the score, numerical value, another one based on the scores, um, uh, kind of percent uh, on the percentage of the um, uh, kind of removing bottom 20% of the index, and the third one that uses tilts. And before I go into that, actually, Darren, if you can go to the next slide. Thank you. What I wanted to briefly touch upon is the, the data source that we are using. So we are using um, Refinitiv ESG scores in our fixed income indices. As I mentioned earlier, Refinitiv or Heritage Thomson Reuters, um, they are a company that we have acquired um, kind of earlier this year and they have really empowered us with a whole set of new capabilities. The, and I wanted to just kind of, you know, tell you a little bit more about their score so you can see some relevant statistics on the screen, you know, so they covered 8% of uh, global market cap, 76 countries. Uh, they have nearly 500 uh, different metrics. But as I say, there's, there's two things I want to highlight about these scores. Uh, one, they are industry relative. So again, what I mean by that is they, they, they get rid of that industry bias for you. So if you use them, you already, you know, they're ranked, the companies are ranked within their industry peers. And two, is the level of transparency. And I kind of haven't put it in the slides here. I should have really shown you the, the screenshot. But if you go into Acon and you kind of log into um, the, the terminal, you can really drill down all the way to the, you know, from where's the score? What is the score for E pillar? Where does it come from? You know, how has it changed? What are the sources for that? And you can kind of drill it all the way down, you know, which is very important to us, you know, exactly how it's constructed. And you know um, you can easily kind of you know um, see that and have that high level of transparency. Uh, if you can go to next slide, <coughs> apologies. Uh, and, and just to give you an idea of how our scores are constructed, so we use a range of uh, sources. Uh, we use company websites, uh, you know, stock exchange filings, uh, different news sources, uh, NGO reports, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have uh, 150 content research analysts. That's only those that specialize in ESG. Uh, we actually have more than 500 ESG uh, specialists specializing in data collection of different data points within the company, which I think is like one of the largest in the markets. Uh, and it has doubled over the last year, uh, which is very exciting for all of us in the team. And what I should also point out is that uh, we have language specialists. So we really have people that understand the language uh, you know, and the nuances of the local market, and they um, kind of conduct that research in that original language um, where possible. So then the kind of the data collection, uh, the materials from data collection, they then go into database. And again, our model for ESG scores is very transparent. It's very formula driven. So you know exactly how they're calculated, you know what the materiality is. You can essentially, you know, kind of um, <clears throat> see the, 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 almost like the formula um, of, of what's behind it. Uh, it's, it's just like all the other traditional ESG scores, we have environmental social governance pillars, you know, and several metrics that go into it. Uh, so that's the scores, that's what we use as a source in this index. And if you go to the next slide, Darren. Thank you. Um, this is, I thought it will help you to see kind of what it, what is, what is behind it. And I think you may be more familiar with some of these uh, specific companies on the screen than me. What I wanted to show here is kind of what does the distribution look like? So, you know, the, <clears throat> um, the golden line is the ESG score. So again, score is zero to 100. 
And then you have the number of bonds in that green blue color and the burgundy, the reddish color is the number of issuers of that bond. And you kind of see where they sit on that curve. So that's, I think quite interesting again to see. Uh, and you can see our coverage as well. So you can see kind of the coverage is actually quite high uh, given it's an emerging market. So I think we're quite happy with that. And then I included a table on the right, if you can see, and I thought that might be interesting for you to see. So that what the table shows you is a credit rating of the bond, so A to CCC, that exists in this portfolio and their average ESG score. So what this broadly tells you is that it, broadly, um, the assumption of uh, high credit rating, high ESG score, low credit rating, low ESG score holds. But of course, this universe is relatively concentrated. So you can still see some, um, I wouldn't call them anomalies, but I would call them, you know, certain companies that just have specific characteristics to this index. You know, like for example, the B minus has, uh, you know, relatively low average score. I think it is driven by two companies there. Um, you know, just like BB and BB plus have a rel relatively high one. But I thought it would be quite interesting for you to kind of see the distribution of that. <clears throat> and then if you go to the next slide, thank you. So if I take you through the way we have created the first screen. So this is a screen for, um, well, this is this, this, when I say screen exclusion, so we kind of use that interchangeably. Um, so there's, there's really two types. So there's the first type where we have taken an ESG of 20. Um, so ESG score of 20 and anyone who's below 20 is excluded. And then there's the second type uh, you know, and this is what you can see, you can kind of see where it draws the line on that graph. So you can see the threshold and the dotted line across, and then anyone who's kind of on the left side is excluded, and then anyone who is on the right side is kept in. And then there's the second type, uh, which really looks at uh, removing the bottom 20% of that index. And then if you go to the next slide, and apologies, I think I haven't mentioned it, it's a US dollar um, market weight, uh, market cap index, um, in case if I forgot to say that. The second iteration of this index is uh, essentially using tilting. So we take a regular approach of, uh, you know, taking the ESG scores, converting them to Z uh, scores, then to S scores, and then we get our ESG score tilt. And then uh, we have a standard market value, kind of the actual index, then we multiply it by the ESG score tilt, and then we get the adjusted ESG uh, index. So essentially what this index does is it takes the companies that have high ESG um, and overweighs them and the companies with the low ESG are underweight. And then if you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Thank you. And here you can essentially see the uh, results, the summary of the backtesting, again, as an example. Uh, a couple of things to, to note, uh, the way we approach it in, in this case is uh, the, uh, there are certain adjustments, so like uh, neutral to the base universe. So we made them sector neutral, which is usually quite important for our clients to make sure that it's sector neutral. So, you know, to keep the proportions the same. Uh, it, it's duration neutral as well. So, you know, we don't want to significantly change the underlying risk characteristics of that index. It has baseline exclusions, so you know those are the ones I mentioned. Kind of, uh, you know, it has ex ex excludes tobacco, thermal coal, um, controversial weapons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then um, we, uh, as I say, we screen based on these three um, characteristics. You know, so that's that's kind of a specific example of something we have done. And I think, yes, I think I'm actually <laughs> just on time, so I appreciate this has been you know quite a lot of information to digest i think i'm going to stop it there um i don't know if there's any questions in there already but i think what would be useful for me and again thank you very much for bearing with me and for for listening <laughs> i hope you could um, kind of grasp where i was going with this um what would be quite useful is obviously to, to hear your questions but also to hear any feedback or to hear how do you approach it uh, you know what are your key considerations um etc thank you sarina yeah um, it is very important for us to understand these practical guidelines on how to incorporate ESG criteria. Um, we have a couple of questions. I'm going to start with the first one. Currently in the world, does issuing ESG bonds have any benefit in prices? Or what benefits 
does issuing or buying ESG securities bring? Yeah, so I guess, um, I guess it's talking about the financial benefit, right? So um, green bonds, uh, you know, they, they typically have a slightly different uh, profile. So they're, they're, they are at premium, right? So there's, there's something called green. <laughs> uh, so they, they typically tend to be more expensive per se. I guess the benefit of that is more of a, around risk, the way you would uh, kind of justify it around financial aspects rather than non-financial aspects is around risk mitigation. So again, if you address uh, ESG factors in your portfolio, you're uh, mitigating the future risk of uh, you know, being, being exposed to a sector that's kind of undesirable or uh, having exposure to a company that's uh, underperforming. So, you know, so I think, I think it would drag the narrative around that. And I would really come back to the graph I showed at the beginning and really at the number of, you know, the policy interventions we have seen and say, whilst at the moment, it may seem like, um, uh, you know, you have to give some yield to have uh, an ESG adjusted portfolio. I think, you know, in, in the longer term that this is where, this is where kind of everything is going. So I would almost look at it as a mitigation of tail risk potentially, um, you know, reputational risk and so on. So I don't know if that fully answered, but those are kind of my thoughts. Thank you, Sarina. That was a question. There's a question by, that was the first question by, was this by Sebastian Peña. Now we have a question by Antonio. <coughs> he asks, if I have a portfolio with different bonds from the same company, does the term or maturity of those bonds affect the overall ESG score of the portfolio at all? Uh, so say that again. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, sure yeah. I if, I have a, if I have a, a portfolio with different bonds from the same, com from the same, the same company, mm -hmm. and the, the term, the question is, the term or maturity of those bonds affect the overall ESG score of, of the yeah. portfolio at all? Okay, yeah, got you, yeah. So the way ESG scores are constructed uh, is typically at an entity level. So if you have a set of bonds um, that belong to the same company, they would typically have the same ESG uh, score. If they have the same issuer, they would have the same ESG score. Now, so, so what that means is that there is no adjustments made in the data set itself in the ESG data set. You know, it's not taken into account what's the specific characteristic of the security. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's not um, it doesn't change the ESG rating. However, what we typically do and how we address it in fixed income is at the construction of, in our case, index, in your case, probably a portfolio, at that construction level, there's things you can do to uh, overweigh or underweigh companies based on duration, let's say, or you know, quite often the, the, the request that we see from clients more often than changing the duration is actually keeping duration the same. So um, I'll give you an example. So if we have an index that has a duration, specific duration profile, we then um, overlay that with ESG and we, we make an ESG version of that index Clients typically want that duration profile to remain exactly the same. So we have adjustments to make at the index or portfolio construction level to make sure duration doesn't change. So hope that answers. Thank you. Thank you, Sarina. We have one more question, if you will. Um, what will you advise to portfolio managers to be able to incorporate ESG investments in a fast and orderly way? Um, I would probably say do, uh, so a fast and orderly way. So you have to look at, you have to start with the data set. So do you have data set available to you that covers your portfolio? Uh, assuming that you do, I would do something along the lines of um, what I mentioned earlier in this call. So you can have, uh, you can exclude 
certain uh, kind of uncontroversially bad things from your index if you host, hold them at all. So those can be things like controversial weapons, tobacco, thermal coal, you know, so exclusionary approach there. And then you look at your portfolio and you look at the worst performance to so really catching that like bottom, bottom pie. And if you remove that, there is a strong evidence that you're removing a significant tail risk um, from your portfolio. So I, you're removing the companies that are more likely to default. So you kind of uh, de-risking de them. So that those, are, those are probably the very fastest and the simplest things you can do. OK, thank you so much, Serena. I think we have one more question by Stefania. Serena, you mentioned that when an investor has a bond, has different ways to make a stewardship. Can you explain a little bit how this works in practice? Yeah, of course. So as an equity investor, you would typically have a voting right. So you would, you know, sit on their board, you own the company, you have very clear, you can kind of use your uh, negative reinforcement, you know, so you, if, if you're saying, please improve your ESG practices, they're not listening, you can vote against certain policies that discourage ESG practices. Um, in a fixed income, it's quite different, you're a bondholder. So what, uh, you know, the, the kind of, the equivalent of negative reinforcement would really be things uh, like covenants, so imposing covenants within their uh, bond. Uh, at the time of refinancing, you can, you know, kind of um, uh, increase, you can increase the cost, uh, you know, you can uh, kind of negotiate or you can just say, I'm not going to finance you unless you do X, Y, Z again. And those are the negative things. But what I really want to stress is that um, there is, those are typically not, those don't, those are not necessarily always um, necessary. So there's an example, I think it was Goldman Sachs, um, where they they had a Russian company, a Russian um, kind of oil and gas company in their portfolio. And one of the things they wanted to encourage them to do is to have more women on their board. And despite of, you know, not having any uh, kind of power of negative reinforcement in case of votes or refinancing in that case, they simply had a series of meetings with the with the CEO of the company and explained the rationale, you know, and explained this is a good thing. And they have taken that on board, you know, and kind of actually improved the um, uh, the, the profile of the board, you know, and it, it recruited more women on the board, uh, which is, you know, another example of it doesn't always have to be, um, it doesn't always have to be uh, kind of so uh, dramatic. <laughs> The other thing as well, and it really depends who is asking. So what quite often the big houses, what they do, they have uh, obviously one team doing equity, another team doing uh, fixed income, but then the, the stewardship team can be joined. So they can you know, be kind of multi-asset and have that multi-asset approach. So that's kind of another way, right? To, to, to impose that through that. So that's how we do it, uh, you know, what in practice, you know, so essentially if you have a portfolio, like just, just to be very, very clear, where you're, let's say, tilting based on the ESG score, um, you know, the fact that uh, higher ESG score rated companies would get a bigger weight and you would invest in them more uh, should, you know, act as an incentive in itself. Um, but if not, then, you know, you can pursue one of these routes. Okay. Well, I guess that's it for today, Serena. Thank you so much. That's all the questions we have. Um, it was a great, it's great to, to have you today to talk about these practical guidelines. It is important for our country and our sector to start talking about incorporating this ESG criteria into fixed income investment decisions. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, guys. It was a pleasure and very happy to follow up with any specific questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Y a todos nuestros asistentes, muchas gracias por su participación el día de hoy. Esperamos que este webinar haya sido de provecho para todos ustedes. Que tengan un feliz día. No olviden eh, seguirnos en nuestras redes sociales, eh, Asofiduciarias, y eh, sigan muy pendientes de los siguientes eventos que la asociación estará programando para el 2022. Muchas gracias para todos. Feliz día.